you everyone for taking time out in your lunch break to come and hear this talk. I see a few fashion faces and a few recycling faces and a few, a lot of other faces I don't know, but thank you all for coming. Um, textiles and fashion is one of the most polluting industries in the world, it's up there in the top three, but it's evolving really, really rapidly. And I just wanted to get a feel for where um, people are in the, in the process. So how many people buy secondhand clothing? Oh, fantastic. Wow, that's really good. Um, and how many people regularly buy it? Cool. Um, so secondhand clothing has now outpaced uh, luxury clothing. Secondhand clothing sales last year hit 360 billion. Um, so as awareness of, of our clothing system arises, people are starting to change their behaviours and really value the clothes that are produced. But we've still got some pretty nasty stats, so um, I'll just I'll start with some of those so we'll get a real um, idea of where we're at. So that little video says we're um, creating 80 billion garments a year. We've actually surpassed that. We're now at 100 billion garments a year and, and growing. Um, the impacts of that is massive. Um, less than 1% of clothing is recycled, so that um, there's a massive loss of resources and a loss of value when we're only recycling and reusing that small percentage. Microfibers are now a contaminant in 80% of the world's waters, microfibers from the clothing, and, um, and not only of our water, but of our food chain. When you wash a police garment, it sheds microfibers, grows out in the wastewater, straight out to sea, and unlike plastic bags that have to wash around and be broken down, Microfibers, clothing fibers are already in uh, really fine form, so they can be um, immediately eaten by the plankton and then it goes into the food chain. So, so it is quite a problem. And, um, and although we've got this really great awareness around plastic bags, clothing is going to be the next, the next great issue that we start facing. Um, clothing consigned to landfill. Uh, produces greenhouse gases, so for each kilo of clothing um, that, that does end up in landfill, that's 3.6 kilos of carbon equivalent that we're producing, so it's the last place that we want it to go. Um, and each year, well not each year, each, each single cotton t-shirt takes about three years of a person's drinking water to produce. So it's a massive, it's a massive resource for to create these our clothing, and then you could treat it as disposable, which is the last thing that it is. So I thought I'd take you on a brief journey on how we ended up working at the unfashionable end of fashion, or the other un un okay, unfashionable end of fashion, and then look at what's what's coming towards us. So this is um, this is in the Philippines. And you can see from this, this dumping of second-hand clothing. Um, you can pick up, there are a couple of people in it. There's one, two, there's another person there. Um, so the scale is massive, and you can see by the location next to a waterway, out of the elements, it, it doesn't take much imagination to realise it. Just need a good rain. The colours will start leaching, the finishes and dyes will start leaching, and you're right into a waterway. Um, New Zealand currently exports $14 million worth of used clothing a year to Papua, just to Papua New Guinea, not even to the rest of the Pacific. So, what happens when you put your clothing into a clothing bin? Most of those bins are owned by a private business, so you're donating. You're gifting your clothes to a private business. They sort through it. About 30% of the, that clothing, like the cream of the crop, stays in New Zealand and is resold through secondhand stores. About 70% ends up offshore, but we think that we're gifting it to people in need. We're actually, it's actually been traded, so it goes into closed bales and then they're now sold sight unseen. Um, by people in developing nations. And why this is an issue is that 
um, for this reason. The margins on those clothing is so small, so if they can't sell the products, they, they generally don't even put into landfill where they can get contained because of the price of paying for it to be landfill. So it ends up just out, um, out in the open, and this creates quite um, a large environmental problem, but also a social problem because people that once had jobs within the textile industry, they lose their jobs because of being undercut by our waste and unwanted clothing. So then it creates a whole social issue as well. And the issue is so significant that a couple of years ago, a group of East African countries proposed a ban on the importation of secondary clothing. Um, the powerful American rag trade opposed it, and so they lobbied Washington so they could keep dumping our unwanted clothes into these developing nations. So it's not ideal. So if, you, if you're thinking about you know, that you don't want to be clothes anymore, Look at reselling. If you do want to donate it somewhere, donate it directly to a charity. Don't put them in the bins. Thank you. So um, back in 2008, a friend of mine, Dr. Eric Falkland, was writing a book on global warming, and he needed another chapter for his publishers. And he said to me, what do you know about sustainable textiles? And at the time, I had a textile importing company, and I said, well, not a lot. And he said, can you help me out? I've got to write this chapter, I don't know a lot about it. And I had a month to write it, the research for it completely blew my mind. The fact that we are churning through so many textiles and only 1% goes back into clothing. It's a massive, massive waste. So we completely changed our business. We upended it to look at what waste textiles are out there and what we can do with them. And then well into them with our coffee culture. Um, that what came up at the time that is used due to burn at coffee sacks. So we created a range of hats. We thought they looked great. Now you can see them on baristas and a number of people around the place. And um, at the time I was working in the shared office with an American interior designer. She said, oh, Starbucks are really lovely. So being Kiwis, we managed to leverage our way into Starbucks in Seattle and presented them with the hats. But they were that fond of the hats, but what we didn't know at the time was they were looking to refurbish their cafes worldwide and they wanted to use the coffee sacks that they generated within the interior design. So we came up with a fabric, um, a blend of wool and a duke coffee sack. We um, started producing it in the global supply chain. Uh, it wasn't enough wool production in the States to move back to the States and so move it to Europe. Starbucks have a massive distribution centre in Amsterdam, so we started producing it in out of the UK. And we won a number of awards. We won awards from Prince Charles, from um, Kevin McLeod from Brand Designs, and we're feeling pretty tough with ourselves. This is us in um, Mayfair in London, where the product was launched. Feeling pretty happy. It was a while ago. I had a lot of hair back in. Um, yeah, so we're feeling pretty smug. And then we saw one of Starbucks warehouses, and this is just one of six warehouses in the States. And we realised, you know, we can take a thousand kilos out of that warehouse, and it would make no difference whatsoever. And that what was needed was actually a systems change around our textiles. So Fast forward to 2015, we were working on a vast bio project in Milan, and um, Starbucks, oh not Starbucks, New Zealand Post approached us because they've been working on a project with their um, post uniforms, upcycling them and re-engineering them, but they faced challenges with it around waste and around market design because they're kind of New Zealand Post colours, bright red, and yellow made from polyester and in re-engineering they had to sort of cut out the sweaty arm bits, the pill bits, the booty bits and so there's a massive waste and nobody wants to use, nobody really wants to wear um, someone's old polyester shirt. So they approached us to review the project and to design a scalable system for, for um, used uniforms. Um, the project that we were working on in Milan had been moved to Romania and then put on hold. So it's actually 
with the timing. So we came back to New Zealand and they suggested to New Zealand Post that they invite other corporates into the program so that we had a volume that could supply a whole or support a whole supply chain, but also because of the investment <coughs> in technology and development, that that also helped fund it. So one of the partners in the program is Wellington Zoo. They were decommissioning their uniforms and so we, we decided to measure the impacts of it and we created a case study from it. So they had a new uniform supplier on board and they were getting, oops, getting rid of their old uniforms so we measured they were getting rid of uh, 1,600 uniforms uh, 479 we could reuse within the community, so using the things really hard wearing, and um, they could go, go out into the community for rewear. Um, there were 750, just a bit more to go through the numbers, but 750 were um, turned into other products. There were 204 garments that were not fit for purpose and returned to the supplier, and then 209 were waste. So we measured all of this, and the result was they conserved eight, just over eight or eight and a half thousand kilos of carbon, but eight hundred thousand litres of water, just by sending those garments out to be reborn. So what we've done with this now is we've now turned it into a digital platform where we can measure the decommissioning of garments. We can capture the the data around it, like how much carbon is conserved how much water is consumed and what that means for a corporation, whether they can trade that carbon, the data can go straight back into a company's sustainability reporting and it can create that sort of behaviour change because once you know what your impacts are, you can start doing something about it. Um, with, uh, with in New Zealand, they've got that iconic in New Zealand fabrics and um, because of the amount of money that companies invest in their brands they don't necessarily want someone walking around with their branding so for in New Zealand to have someone with a coro print re-engineered into a pair of shorts or something like that so it's one of the look for the company so um, so brand protection is really really important so again we worked with a company in the states called Moral Fiber we took their polyester uniforms back to, um, or through green chemistry, back to its molecular parts, extracted the dyes, and it ended up with um, a PET plastic. So you can use that plastic in anything. You can use it in glasses, frames, and cups, and anything that you make a plastic out of. So these are the sort of things that we're working on at research and development of solutions because globally we've for decades we've just been throwing our clothes away and so we have to build the system up from the ground up. So we have to research the solutions, we have to develop them, we have to pilot them and then commercialise them. So after two years of research and development and product trials, we launched the program last year. Uh, um, Minister J.D. Sage launched the program last year and um, the, this start of the, of the program we're working on some really interesting um, research. One of them in particular is around loading. So at the moment, our, a lot of our cotton waste, so our hospital sheeting, our hotel sheeting, our um, prison sheeting goes to landfill when it's been decommissioned. And that creates greenhouse gas gases. And in the meantime, we're importing a lot of cellulose from Germany to go into our roading to get its strength. And cotton is just cellulose, so we're working with Scion to take our waste cotton and turn it into a form that can be used within our roading. So we're reducing the carbon because we're not shipping stuff from Germany. We also haven't got our cotton um, wasting away and decomposing in the landfill, creating greenhouse gases. So these are sort of projects that we're working on so that we can deal with our waste stream within New Zealand's, um, you know, with, within our island capacity. Um, 
The other projects that we're working on are building materials, geo textiles, so when you're driving down the road and along the motorway and you've got all the plant right through planting or planting along those motorways. Most of the plants are held in place by a synthetic bedding fabric and then it just sort of shreds away as it, as it leads down, ends up in the waterways, it's not great. So we're developing geo textiles, out of our textiles that, that can support the planting and that as it breaks down has a nutrient between to the soil. So supporting what we do is a technology um, platform. So we, the, with Wellington Zoo, so we measured the environmental impacts. A, a lot of companies now, like um, Stella McCartney, is working with Google to, with blockchain trans, supply chain transparency, whether they can measure the impacts of what they're doing and, and track what they're doing from um, farmers' fields through to retail. And what we do is we take it from retail to end of life because the impacts of our clothes are so great that it's, it, is, it is as important where your clothes end up as where they come from. Another, te another technology that we're developing is an AI technology around spectroscopy. So you can um, use a scanner and we can tell exactly what your garment is made from. And this is really important around processing because with clothing, if someone's cut off the label, you don't know if it's 20% polyester, 80% polyester, if it's nylon, you know exactly what the construction of that fabric is. And in processing it, different, uh, different types of fibres require different forms of processing. So being able to verify it's really important. And the um, the other thing is, if you're ordering something, if you're ordering a consignment of t-shirts or of shirts, you want to know that your organic cotton shirt is not actually just a, a poly cotton. So that's, um, that's an important part of the whole process, is the verification. So aside from what we're doing, one of the things that I want to talk to you about is ethical purchasing. Um, I did my master's in ethical purchasing, and up until the start of the research, I believe that ethical purchasing was a way forward, it was a way to protect our environment and it was a way to protect society. But having completed my research, I've completely changed my views on it. And I can see someone over here smiling. Um, yeah, so my research led me to investigate how ethical purchasing works and the results of it. And I came away from that believing that the individualisation of responsibility is completely, completely unfair. That through deregulation, privatisation, free trade deals, what once was the responsibility of, of public sector and government to protect the environment and to protect society has been passed to the, to the private sector. And for you and I, it's really hard to navigate whether some brands or whether particular products are more ethical than another. A, a supply chains are really, really complex. And this construct of ethical purchasing really is, um, it's a marketing department and marketing industry construct. So instead of trying to navigate that as individuals, it's completely unfair on us to have to take responsibility for the state of the environment and for the state of society. What we should be doing is pushing back so that governments have the policies in place to protect the environment and to protect um, citizens and workers' rights. So I know it's a little controversial, because we kind of need to believe that ethical purchasing is the way forward. But given the state of things, and we only have 10 years to reduce the massive um, environmental impacts and reduce our carbon production, if we're going to stay under that 1.5 degree um, pathway for, for the climate crisis, what we need now is, is not just a, 
announced to have what we need now is real policy change to to support and to protect both citizens and, and the environment. The other interesting thing that's arisen recently is the concept of environmental personhood. So, um, to employ in their, in their negotiation, treaty negotiations, they came up with this idea. And it's a really interesting one. So they, they, grant, they were granted legal um, personhood over the Euro Rio Rangers. And it's a fantastic concept because the Euro is two boys' ancestor. And what this has done is basically recognised um, what Māori already know and pushed it into English law. So India has followed suit. They've, they've granted the Ganges legal personhood and in Ecuador we see seeing similar action. So the result of this, it, it's really interesting from a legal perspective. So if, if like Wellington Harbour is um, its own legal person. Can you put Wellington Harbour on the board of your fashion brand? Can you pay it 0.5% of your profits to protect it? Can you protect um, aquifers from bottling companies? And if you and if you pollute um, a natural resource that has has um, environmental personhood, can you be done for assault? Will this take it out of the environmental court and into the civil court? It's a really fascinating change in, in our laws. And just in, in finishing, what I want to say is, you know, the, the enormity of the climate crisis can be quite overwhelming, but. Um, we think, in Formary, we think it's a, an incredible time that humans have this innate ability to problem solve and that we can bring our genius and our creativity to design a new world where we, um, where we live within the biophysical limits of our planet and we should be really, really optimistic about our ability to do so. Thank you.